So welcome, welcome to those joining on Zoom. Welcome those who will be watching on YouTube later. Um, I'm really happy to be together tonight, today, whatever time it is. And I see a few more folks joining in. We're just getting started. So this is perfect. Welcome. Um, hi. I wanted to start this evening with some thoughts, reflections, and then go into practice. A few more little bits of reflections and then open up for some conversation and shared, uh, shared spoken practice and listening practice. So um, you're welcome to be, you know, in whatever posture you feel comfortable in. I do appreciate getting to see a few folks on screen and totally appreciate those who are taking care of themselves, have their screens off. Um, and we'll have this evening's topic of Dharma, decolonization and deep listening, um, which are all very, very big topics. So obviously I'm not gonna <laughs> go into the depths, but I'm hoping to bring a few pieces together in a way that might be fruitful for ongoing practice. Um, and I know in many parts of the States, today is Indigenous Peoples Day. In Canada, we are having our version of Thanksgiving. Um, and so that was part of the choice of sharing this now. Um, although it's always Indigenous people stay and it's always a relevant topic. Um, so that's some of the background. And as we begin, you know, there's various ways that land acknowledgements happen and get shared and we're all in different locations. Um, so I wonder if we could just take a moment to really feel gravity feel the pull of the earth itself, the holding capacity of the earth. As at least one of my indigenous friends will often say, it's like, it's about your relationship with the earth, most importantly. So make sure that that's the center of any acknowledgement. And then whatever awareness we have of the very violent and complex and layered histories of the lands we lived upon. And also any openness for appreciation for just how precious it is to have land to live on, this chance of being where we are However, we got here, we're still the benefactor. We're, we are um, receiving what has been handed down from previous generations, the stewardship of, of the past is truly giving us life today in so many ways. And maybe taking a moment to see how there might be one step in the next week or month that we may want to tune into, feel inspired by or commit, even if it's really tiny in the direction of deeper respect and reverence for Indigenous stewards and current communities that the lands we live upon are related to. And it's really in the spirit of attempting to learn ways of respect that have not been handed down from previous generations um, that this talk is being offered I come as a white settler um, so i'm by no means an expert in this but it's definitely my responsibility to learn um, and i think it's an opportunity to to share through the Dharma uh, wider and wider ways of approaching liberation. So tonight I want to work with a few core um, bodies of teachings. Um, one is particularly, uh, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh being one of my 
teachers and my root teacher and the person that I had ordained under when I was a monastic. So I'm very rooted in that tradition, though I'm also rooted in the insight the Pasna tradition. Um, there's this teaching that Thich Nhat Hanh gave, I remember, I think it was January 3rd, 2013, I was at Plum Village, I've been ordained about a year and a half, maybe half a year. Um, and he was teaching on the historical and ultimate dimension, or I think in Tibetan they call it the material and the absolute. So this idea that we find a lot of Buddhist dreams that there is the day-to-day, -day, you, me, tables, chairs, birth and death. And then there's on the deepest ultimate dimension, no birth and death, no separation between you and me. Um, and that they both coexist. Some folks liken it, it's not exactly the same, but there's a lot of similarities to when you think of you know, modern or well, current um, physics, quantum physics that, you know, if you look at my mug, I mean, it holds water, it has substance. <laughs> if I drop it, it'll break, like there, there's matter to it. And Newtonian laws do have their effect, but if you take an electron microscope or if you look even more deeply, it's almost all space. And then if we look at any particle, we can't even pin down where it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> so in many ways, that's kind of like the ultimate dimension. It's just like mind blowing and yet it's existing within something that looks solid and, and I look solid and you look separate from me, but we didn't read the deepest level of reality or the ultimate level. Um, there is no separation. There is no fixed beginnings and ending points. There are only continuations and forms that shift. And you'd often give this teaching of, you know, you have a cloud passing by and then the water vapor you could say it, a cloud dies but when it starts raining the water molecules only change form and then when the rain joins a lake the rain didn't die but it's changed forms um, the water molecules continue and then when you drink a cup of tea and pee it out <laughs> it's all continuation and he gave that story particularly I liked talking about peeing out your tea uh, sometimes um, so that's a really, especially in more of a Mahayana Buddhist sense of teachings, we really look at this idea that there's only continuation, although it's also found in the source, the earliest recorded um, early Buddhism as well. So with this context of what we call the two truths, sometimes it's one of the many names, it's he started this particular teach that teaching that I've gone back to many times and i'll put it in the the notes. Um, for this uh, session when the video gets recorded, which is um, he gave this teaching one day, he said you know everyone wants to get to the ultimate dimension, we want to find our awakening, we want to find the peace of deep meditation. Um, we want to be free from suffering. And so that's, he drew like one line on the, the whiteboard. He said, but we're living here in the ultimate dimension where there's suffering and we have to get through our days and we have our difficulties and we have the pain. And so this question of the Dharma is how do you get from the historical to the ultimate? And it looked like there's an equal sign written on the, the board. And so he took out his marker and he drew this diagonal line and he said, we have to practice and know the, the sign of Zorro and I kind of chuckled. And so with this diagonal line, so we had a Z or a Z on the board. And he said, so what, what is it that connects us from the historical to the ultimate? And he said, people often think that you just have to try and escape the historical, um, deep concentration and block everything else out or shape your life in a way that there's no difficulties. Um, but that's not how you get to the ultimate dimension. That's not how you find freedom from suffering. You actually go so deeply into the historical, that it takes you 
into the ultimate and that for him was his Zorro sign. Um, which may sound simple, but it's pretty radical in its own way uh, in that in that so many teachings, especially other religious teachings, some Buddhist versions, there's a sense of just wanting to transcend things, get, get up and out. And this is really like an invitation down and in. Um, the way I've experienced it, it's like getting so deeply into the experience that I'm getting down to that molecule level within the pain or within the anxiety that suddenly I find this space level, kind of like the space between molecules <laughs> and things kind of shift. Sometimes it happens in, in form of practice, but it can also happen as we look at the larger world, which is where um, a particular body of decolonial teachings that I have been studying this year have really been doing this on, in a different way that is entirely related to the ways I have been learning before, but they're working together synergistically. And I'm so excited about it. Basically, I just want to like share some bodies of work with a lot of folks and say, I hope this helps you too. So um, the particular decolonial work that I've been looking into um, has been coming from a collective called Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures. And um, there are many, many members. It's an Indigenous and non-Indigenous collective of artists, educators, um, community members of all of in Canada, the States, Brazil, um, although there's a lot of folks in the Vancouver area who are engaged. And they create pedagogical experiments. A lot of them teach or work around global citizenship education. So they find really creative and interesting ways of teaching and explaining things often to grade school and high school students so they are able to like bring some pretty uh, nuanced thinking into a space where they have to be able to explain things pretty simply. And in case you're interested, um, I'll just put a few links into the chat. Um, one of the members, Dr. Vanessa Andre Audi wrote a book called Hospicing Modernity that carries a lot of their core concepts and teachings and practices, as well as a poem that I'm going to be sharing pieces of during our meditation later on. Um, so one of the ways of looking at colonization that this collective works with goes specifically to an understanding from the Hunikui people of the Amazon, um, where they see colonization not just as the subjugation of land, resources, and extraction, um, and people, but they understand colonization as the very act of believing that there's a separation between humans, other humans, and the land, and the whole cosmos, really. And I know I had I had heard that concept within the Dharma as well. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh speaks of interbeing. There are other versions of this teaching that Indra's net, um, that image that has been given in many of the sutras, where the whole cosmos is a vast net, and at each knot is one of the beings. And there's a jewel at that knot that reflects every single other jewel in the cosmos. And if you think of a net, if you move one point, everything else is going to move too. So that's an image that has been given for thousands of years of the fundamental interdependence or interconnectedness of every phenomena. So it's not all that different of a, of a, of a teaching, but to, to frame it as a colonial mindset not just human ignorance um, started to give me different nuances it kind of was helping me go deeper into the historical as a way to come to the ultimate and so the way that um, gesturing towards decolonial futures shares this they they actually have created this this term of separability to name the colonial mindset 
of separation. And flipping it around because I think for a lot of us raised in modernity um, and within colonial educational systems, even, you know, oh yeah, like I can understand that there is interdependence, but we're so steeped in a mentality of separation that this collective is throwing out language of like, actually the truth is the, our inseparability. And let's name the notion of separability as a, as a function of a diseased mindset, of a ignorance, right? That is causing great harm on every level, ecological, interpersonal, economic. Um, because if we, if we understand ourselves as separate, then violence can happen. But if we don't understand separation, then you have to take care of each other. You have to have, you recognize that there is relationship. Um, so I wonder even just right now to what it would be like to tune into, huh, fundamental inseparability, sort of the foundation and that the notion of separability is this anomaly anomaly that has spread rampant like an invasive species <laughs> for thinking of biology but that doesn't mean that it's actually the truth and does this give a different nuance that can work with a new a notion like inter interbeing giving us a different way to think about it. I also um, was deeply moved by one of the ways that, um, that this collective and, and in many, many indigenous um, traditions look at the role of ceremony and this actually came from a conversation that I, a podcast that I put in that Vanessa Andriotti was having with the podcast host, speaking about the, some of the wisdom teachings she's received from the Huniqui people. Um, and she's from Brazil herself originally, um, though she lives in, in Victoria now. And she was saying that, especially in the context of <laughs> Western folks coming down um, to the Amazon to do medicine ceremony, plant medicine ceremony, that people are constantly coming, hoping for experiences of bliss, experiences of going back to a childlike state of no sense of responsibility and, and being able to just sort of like rest or space out and tune out the stressors of the world. And that f within a traditional sense, this was completely absurd because the point of ceremony and especially plant medicine and ceremony is to learn to become a good elder, is to learn how am I called to serve my community. And as I heard this conversation again, I was like, whoa, this is a really helpful context, but it's actually also incredibly familiar because that's a traditional sense of what the Dharma is for. <laughs> um, you know, the ethics are the foundation of the whole path. The Buddha taught ethics before meditation, before a lot of the other pieces um, of, of the teachings, right? And the ethics of how do we care for each other? How do we live without causing harm? I mean, I, th I think that's similar to this question of how do you become a good elder? How do you take care of your community? Uh, not the same. And that's where I actually felt that this wording like enlivened my clarity of like, what is my practice about? And it's working with what I already, has some understanding of, but it's giving me more nuance to go more deeply into this historical understanding. Look at the details of how I'm living, how I'm interacting. Ooh, am, am I engaging in my practice to learn to become a good elder? Or if that's not a word that necessarily resonates, to, to, to take care of my community. And adding that to a more Buddhist wording of, how to not cause harm or how to minimize harm and how to cultivate wholesome mind states and wholesome engagement in relationships. Um, 
again, another set of wording that Vanessa Andriotti was sharing was this, again, very common, not, not unique to her, um, but this question of like, are we attempting to control things by engaging in our practice, by how we're living our lives, or are we opening to mystery? Yeah. Um, you know, again, this is not different from the core of Dharma and Zen, there's this very famous quote of not knowing is the most intimate. It was the sixth patriarch of China, but I can't quite remember. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh would often ask, are you sure? And like write it in calligraphy or just pop it out there from time to time as this encouragement to like, wait a minute. <laughs> Are you opening to beginner's mind? Are you actually meeting here and now as it is? Are you trying to have a tighter sense of control? And yet this very simple question, the way that Vanessa phrased it, are you trying to control things? Or are you open to mystery? Again, that gave a different nuance of a similar um, teaching and it's really been opening my heart and, and helping uh, bring more life to practice. Oh, actually, I just found my notes. Not knowing the most is the most intimate comes from one of the koan collections and the Blue Cliff Record, Book of Equanimity. So one more phrasing that I wanted to share in case it's helpful for you, because it's been helpful for me. Um, and then I'm going to shift the focus a little bit is the phrasing that specifically gesturing towards decolonial futures has um, brought up has I think it is specific to them. Um, is the whole sense of a self how they <laughs> how they describe it, which I find pretty brilliant. Um, and again, this is the context of doing a lot of work within a public education kind of setting. And so they aren't working specifically in spiritual, religious, or specific cultural settings, but they're trying to bring some of the wisdom of what is learned in a more traditional setting to where folks are. Um, and so they have created this wording of, they see that um, being able to sense into our inseparability or our interbeing is actually the way they word it is as a neurobiological capacity that has been numbed through colonialism and modernity. And so that the work of growing as a human, whether we see that as a spiritual path or to, you know, uh, we don't use that wording, our work is to reactivate our numbed neurobiological capacity to recognize ourselves as part of the metabolic process of life that is the entire cosmos. We are all parts of the living earth, the living cosmos. And there's something I find, again, like Thich Nhat Hanh has very similar teachings to this. But this is a different wording and nuance that kind of sparked something of like, oh, a numbed neurobiological capacity. That it's a capacity that we all have. And it actually just made so much sense of like, oh, yeah, I've known that. I Lots of folks that I know have known that, but we, we get numbed. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that our, our role, our work, that some of the most important work we can be doing in this moment of crisis, of deep suffering, is to learn to reactivate our numbed neurobiological capacity to sense ourselves part of the metabolic process of life of the cosmos. And, uh, and if we're only used to turning, tuning into what our ego is saying, then we can't hear what the land is saying. We can't hear what the ancestors are saying. 
Um, as I heard this way of speaking, I thought, oh, that's what, that's my understanding of the deep listening practice that we speak of in Buddhism. It's not, to, it's, it's not tuning into me, <laughs> although it is tuning into the heart, but it's tuning into the heart or tuning into the earth, tuning into the cosmic intelligence that is bigger than just me, but it does live within me like it lives within you, like it lives within the plants and the clouds. Mm. I mean, one of my favorite phrases that Thich Nhat Hanh says, we are here to wake up from the illusion of our separation. It's not exactly the same thing as what this collective is saying, but, but it's so synergistically potent together. And, and I don't mean to flatten or to equivocate or say like, oh, it's the same thing. It's, it's not. But I, I, I think a lot of the work, especially, you know, not just taking it as well, it's to general human ignorance. But there are also specific systems that have like really amplified this particular ignorance that have constructed how we interact, how notions of what, what types of information is worthwhile and what kind of government is legitimate and which people deserve to have their rights and uh, lives respected and don't. To not just recognize that as the Dharma often will name, yeah, it's ignorance, it's greed, craving, and delusion. Uh, sorry, greed, um, hatred, or aversion, and delusion. It's also systems that we can like understand. And so that's some of how I understand it. And what I've seen in my practice is that that's some of this top line, this going more deeply into the historical dimension, but not to stay there and not to just get lost in the despair of how horrible it is, but to understand how can I understand more and more deeply, more and more deeply in a way that's connected to opening us up into the ultimate dimension. Into the both and. And uh, in, in June, Lama Rod Owens came to Toronto and gave a teaching that was very powerful. And he started it also speaking about the historical and ultimate dimension. And he said, you know, there's like, there's me, there's my identity, there's my place in the world, there's history and society and all the specifics. And that material dimension is a truth. There's not the whole truth. And he raised his other hand and said, and then there's there's, I am not my identities and labels, and I'm not this birth and death, and I'm none of the details. I'm the whole cosmos, and there is no separation between I am just fully Buddha mind. He said, but that's only a half the truth, too. We only come to the full truth when we hold the two together. Which then made me think of Thich Nhat Hanh's sorrow. I guess if, if anything that I can share tonight, it's, it's the idea that um, this particular body of decolonial work, and I think decolonial work in general, is the engagement that is needed today for our Dharma practice <laughs> to really be about deep liberation for all, and that it can actually help us go so deeply into the historical that we also can find the ultimate, not just for ourselves, but for all beings, um, especially in a way that's not going to further the horrific violence and harm to Indigenous people that is still ongoing. And again, for those connected to Thich Nhat Hanh's lineage in particular, I mean, he started resisting French occupation and speaking out against American military engagement and also speaking out about, um, you know, communist uh, problematics too. you know, he, he was an equal opportunity uh, critic of any system that was harming people. Um, but there's actually like very deep anti colonial roots in a lot of Dharma streams that have an engaged practice so. So it's, this isn't a new thing, um, but finding out how to do it for today 
where we are is our each person's work. And so this is how I've been engaging with this. And I hope it's helpful getting to share it. Um, so I want to shift into some practice that I'm actually just going to read excerpts from one of the poems um, that is in this book, Hospicing Modernity. It was written by a number of members in the Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures Collective. And I'm going to start with guiding us into a practice of deep listening and then offer some of this poem that is called Co-Sense with Radical Tenderness. Yeah. So please set yourself up in a position that's supportive for you, whether that's sitting, standing, lying down. You can do this walking or wheeling as well, um, although a lot of folks do like to stay stationary. Cameras on or off, eyes open or closed, it's really whatever supports you. I'm going to start by sounding the bell three times um, for many reasons, and definitely one of them is honoring the lineage that I've been steeped in, where the sound of the bell is, is an invitation to come home and to listen deeply within. Tuning into the sense of gravity, contact of body, and supporting surface, which is the hold, the embrace of the earth. Perhaps letting the earth hold you a little more, if we can hold ourselves up a little less. While at the same time finding perhaps some solidity or strength, stability in the spine, Allowing for space in the heart, perhaps, space for the body to breathe as best it can. Breathing this air that is shared air that was breathed by the Buddha, by our ancestors, by 
house plants and trees and grasses. Maybe subtle, may not even be present, but what would it be like to just explore and tune into the subtle vibrations that some people would call a sense of aliveness? if that is part of the living metabolism of life that we are part of what's that what if that's one way to tune into our neurobiological capacity to sense our inseparability our inner being. Don't need to think about it too much. Just, just play with it. We can always come back to the contact with the ground, stability of the spine, maybe some dignity. The in and out of breath. Both resting on the earth, but also waking up awareness. Being just a little more curious about right here and right now. sense with radical tenderness and tune into the collective body both human and non-human we tune into the collective body we may notice something we may not it's all fine we may doubt or question all fine we may sense so much that it's overwhelming so go ahead take some space from that maybe just explore the edge of the collective body or return to something more grounding Go sense with radical tenderness and feel your entanglement with everything, including the ugly, the broken, and the messed up.
Be open to the gifts of disillusionment and dissolution to surrender without collapsing. Surrender without collapsing. Make space for the unknown and the unknowable in ourselves and in others. Co-sense with radical tenderness and notice the ways in which our thoughts and emotions are biophysical processes. Listen to non-human authorities and care about your relationship with them.
body resting on earth, breathing the shared air. Finding a balance of restfulness, ease, and wakefulness, kind curiosity. Oh, sense with radical tenderness and learn from repeated mistakes to make only new ones in the future. co-sense with radical tenderness 
and offer the gifts of your failures. Co-sense with radical tenderness and understand that the earth is not an extension of our bodies, it's the other way around. For the last few minutes of this practice, if you wish, keep tuning into this hum, this radical tenderness of co sensing tuning into the living metabolism through our inherent neurobiological capacity. And just listen to hear if this life force, if the earth, if ancestors are whispering or calling to you in any way, or offering you anything
with this spirit of deep listening. And if there are any thanks, any acknowledgements, any, any anything you want to offer back, please do so as part of this stream of life, life force, living metabolism. If your eyes have been closed, you might want to gently re-invite sight in. And if your body's been still, you might want to gently re-invite in movement, taking care, offering care. Maybe continuing to tune into this hum as we're shifting so before we open to conversation and reflections which I know sometimes can also feel a little abrupt coming out of a meditation time I just wonder what it'd be like if we actually try together obviously everything is optional um, but if you wish to try along with me to, to just hold out one hand and tune into this sense of the me that I know, my stories, my dukkha, the, the realm where there's a lot of 
hard things happening. And to hold up the other hand and tune into this sense of ah, the living metabolism that includes all the hard stuff, but it's just so much bigger. It is the whole cosmos. It is all of space and time. Infinitely, always loving, holding, carrying, guiding, And what would it be like to invite these hands to move towards one another? They don't actually have to touch it, they don't want to, but what would it be like to invite them to, to connect and maybe touch? Can this honoring of the both and be a little, a little blessing tonight? So at this point, we're going to shift and I think here we can end the recording. That's okay, Walt. <laughs>